Chapter 6, Two Mai of the Elephants. Kalanag, which means black snake, had served the Indian government in every way that an elephant could serve it for 47 years, and he was fully 20 years old when he, caught, when he was caught. That makes him nearly 70, a ripe old age for an elephant. He remembered pushing with a big leather pad on his forehead at a gun stuck deep in the mud. And that was before the Afghan War of 1842. And he had not then come to his full strength. His mother, Radha Priya, Radha the Darling, who had been caught in the same drive as Karl Nag, told him before his little milk tusks had dropped out, the elephants who were afraid always got hurt. And Karl Nag knew that that advice was good. For the first time that he saw a shell burst, he backed screaming into a stand of piled rifles and the bayonets pricked him in all his softest places. So before he was 25, he gave up being afraid. And so he was the best loved and best looked after elephant in the service of the government of India. He had carried tents, 1,200 pounds worth of tents on the march in Upper India. He had been hoisted onto a ship at the end of a steam crane and taken for days across the water, which, made, which were made to carry a mortar on his back in a strange and rocky country very far from India and had seen the Emperor Theodore lying dead in Magdala, and had come back again in the steamer, entitled, so the soldiers said, to the Absian War Medal. He had seen his fellow elephants die of cold, epilepsy, starvation and sunstroke at a place called Ali Masjid. Ten years later, and afterwards, he had been sent down thousands of miles south to haul big pile of balks of teak in the timber yard at Malmain. There, had, there he had half killed an insubordinate young elephant who was shirking his fair share of the work. After that, he was taken off the timber hauling and employed with a few score other elephants who were trained to, be, to the business in helping to catch wild elephants among the Garo Hills. Elephants are very strictly preserved by the Indian government. There is a whole department which does nothing else but hunt them and catch them and break them in and send them up and down the country as they are needed for work. Carla Snag stood ten fair feet at the soldiers and his tusks had been cut off, short at five feet and bound round the ends to prevent them splitting with bands of copper. But he, had, but he could do more with those stumps than any untrained elephant could do with their real sharpened ones. When, after weeks and weeks of cautious driving of scattered elephants across the hills, the 40 or 50 wild monsters were driven into the last stockade. And the big drop gates made of three trunks lashed together, jarred down behind them. Karl and Ag, at the word of, word of command, would go into that flaring, trumpeting pandemonium, generally at night when the flicker of the torches made it difficult to judge distances, and picked out the biggest and wildest tusker of the mob would hammer him and hustle him into a quiet while the men on the backs of the other elephants roped and tied the smaller ones. There was nothing in the way of fighting that Carla Nag, the old wise black snake, did not know. For he had stood up more than once in his time to the charge of the wounded tiger and, curling in his soft trunk to be out of harm's way, he knocked the springing brute sideways in midair with a quick sickle cut of his head. That he had intervened all by himself, had knocked him over and kneeled upon him with his huge knees till the life went out, of, out with a gasp and a howl. And there was only a fluffy striped thing on the ground for Carla Nag to pull by the tail. Yes, the big Tumai, his driver, the son of Black Tumai, who had been taken to him by Abyssinia, and grandson of Tumai, of the elephants who had been seen, who'd seen him caught. There is nothing that the black snake fears except me. He has seen three generations of us feed him and groom him, and he will live to see four. He is afraid of me also, said little Tumai, standing up to his full height of four feet, with only one rag upon him. He was ten years old, the eldest son of big Tumai, and, according to custom, he would take his father's place on Carla Nag's neck when he grew up and would handle the heavy iron ankus the elephant 
gold that had been worn smooth by his father and his grandfather and his great grandfather. He knew what he was taking off for he had been born under Carla Nag's shadow, had played with the end of his trunk before he could walk, had taken him down to the water as soon as he could walk and Carla Nag would no more have dreamed of disobeying his shrill little orders than he would have dreamed of killing him on that day when Big Tumai carried the little brown baby under Carl and Nag's tusks and told him to salute his master that was to be. Yes, said little Tumai, he is afraid of me. And he took long strides up to Carl and Nag, called him a fat old pig and made him lift up his feet one after the other. Why, said little Tumai, thou art big elephant. And he wagged his fluffy head, quoting his father. The government may pay for elephants, but they belong to us mahouts. When thou art old, Kalanag, there will be some rich raha, and he will buy th- thee from the government on account of thy size and thy manners, and thou will have nothing to do but carry gold earrings in thy ears, and a gold necklace on thy back, and a red cloth covered with gold on thy sides, and walk there at the head of the procession of the king. Then I shall sit on thy neck, O Carla Nag, with a silver anchors, and men will run before us with golden sticks, crying, Room for the king's elephant. That will be good, Carla Nag, but not so good as this hunting in the jungles. Ha! <sighs> said Big Tumai, thou art a boy, and as wild as a buffalo calf. This running up and down among the hills is not the best government service. I am getting old. I do not love wild elephants. Give me brick elephant lines, one stool to each elephant, and big stumps to tie them to safely, and flat, broad rows to exercise upon, instead of this come-and-go camping. I have the canopy barracks were good. There was a b- b- bazaar close by, and only three hours' work a day. Little to my remembered the Kanpur elephant lines and said nothing. He very much preferred the camp life. He hated those broad, flat roads with dirt, with daily grubbing for grass in the forage reserve and the long hours when there was nothing to do except watch Carl and Oak fidgeting in his pickets. What little tomb I liked was the scramble up riddle paths that only the elephant could take, the dip into the valley below, the glimpses of the wild elephants browsing miles away, the rush of the frightened pig and peacock under Carl and Oak's feet, the blinding warm rains when all the hills and valleys smoked, the beautiful misty mornings when nobody knew where they would camp that night, the steady cautious drive of the wild elephants and the mad rush and blaze of the hullabaloo of the last night's drive. When the elephants poured into the stockade like boulders in a landslide, found that they could not get out, they flung themselves at the heavy posts only to be driven back by yells and flaring torches and volleys of black cartridge. Even a little boy could be used that would be of use there, and Tumai was as useful as three boys. He would get his torch and wave it and yell with the best. But the really good time came when the driving out began, and the kedah, that is the stockade, looked like a picture of the end of the world, and men had to make signs to one another because they could not hear themselves speak. Then little Tumai would climb up to the top of one of the quivering stockade posts his sun-bleached brown hair flying loose all over his shoulders, and he looking like a goblin in the torchlight. And as soon as there was a lull, you could hear his high-pitched yells of encouragement to Carl and Ag, above the trumpeting and crashing and snapping of ropes and groans of tethered elephants. Go on, go on, black snake. Give him the tusk. Careful, careful. Hit him, hit him. Mind the post. He would shout and the big fight between Carl and Ag and the wild elephant would sway to and fro across the kedah and the old elephant catchers would wipe the sweat out of their eyes to find the time to nod to little Tumai wriggling with joy on the top of the posts. He did more than one wriggle. One night he slid down from the post and slipped in between the elephants and threw up the loose end of the rope which had dropped to the driver who was trying to get a purchase on the leg of a kicking calf Calves always gave more trouble than full-grown animals. Kalanag saw him, caught him in his t- trunk and handed him up to Big Tumai who slapped him then and there and put him back on the post. Next morning, 
he gave him a scolding and said, are not good brick elephant lines and a little tent carrying enough that thou might needs to go elephant catching on thy own account? Little worthless. Now those foolish hunters whose pay is less than my pay have spoken to Peterson Sahib of the matter. Little to I was frightened. He did not know much of white men, but Peter Sahib was the greatest white men of them all. He was the head of the Qadar operations, the man who caught all the elephants for the government of India and who knew more about the ways of elephants than any living man.